and welcome to tonight's episode of Beginner Breakdown. My name as always is Alex Mollering and I'm excited to be uh, talking with you tonight. The theme is thinking, calculation, move selection, right? You're playing the game of chess. The whole game is about what am I supposed to do? How do I think about my move and making those right decisions? And so today I'm gonna teach you about thinking, <laughs> which we may think we know, but sometimes it, it, it applies differently in different situations. So I have good news for you. When we're playing a game of chess, there's actually only two times we have to think. It's really exciting. I know you thought it was a lot more than that. It's actually just two. We only have to think when it's our move and when it's our opponent's move. But if we think when it's our move and our opponent's move, then we're totally good. It's just those two times. I'm right, being a little facetious here, but um, the, the real question is, what should we be thinking about in those two situations? Because I think it is slightly different. How should we be managing our time, especially if you're playing with a clock, or even if you're playing just with a friend casually, you still don't wanna be the one sitting there thinking forever. Um, we do have a limited amount of processing power to calculate our variations. So let's consider some positions and kind of walk it through. And I'll, let me present you a few different situations. So here's our first situation. Imagine you're playing a classical game of chess. For those not familiar with tournament terminology, this basically means it's a long form game. Um, and we're gonna say both players have over an hour on the clock. So plenty of time to think. In this position, you're playing with the white pieces and you have already decided to recapture the D-pawn. Um, I believe Black's last move was to capture here. Um, so we will recapture this pawn. Now, uh, it is our opponent's turn, and instead of quickly playing a move, they put their hands on their head, start analyzing the position, you know, really trying to get in deep and trying to figure out what should I do here. And there's some candidate moves they might play, but it's their move. So we don't know exactly what they're gonna play, what should we be thinking about here while it's their turn to move? Any thoughts from our audience, either online or in person, feel free to comment. What would you be thinking about here as it's uh, their turn to move? How can we use our time? Uh, Mickey K in the chat says potential threats. So that's a really good thing. Um, and we can actually do this for both sides. We can think what are their threats? What are ours? Uh, maybe what moves are we threatening or what positional ideas are we threatening? Um, what are their ideas? Uh, Teo just suggests F6. So actually looking at possible moves they might play. Candidate moves. Um, checks and captures, queen h4. So a lot of different ways people are approaching this. Some people, it seems about half and half are thinking, uh, one half is saying we should think about what are the ideas? What's the kind of overall structure in the position? Um, what are the threats? And then the other half are suggesting moves and saying, okay, what if they play this? Or what if they play this? What are we gonna do in those situations? How do we think about um, the position? Okay, so already this is really, really helpful. Um, now let's imagine that they spend several minutes and eventually come up with the move knight to b4. And maybe we were expecting a move like pawn to f6 or queen to b6, um, but knight to b4 was a little surprising to us. Now, it's our move. What should we be thinking about here? Has our process changed at all? What are you thinking about? Uh, this is still theory, so this is kind of like in the French. Um, uh, I imagine it was like they played knight f6 quickly and we pushed so the advanced French and their knight drops back here. And they've tried to break through with c5, we've defended with c3, that's where these pawns have ended up. Um, so that's basically where we are. But I believe this is still theoretical. Knight b4, I'm not sure how theoretical it is. It's, it's a bit more unusual, but I think it has seen play even at the high levels. Um, okay, so in the chat, a few suggestions. Someone's suggesting just playing a move bishop b1. Someone is saying whether we should keep our bishop by moving it, uh, whether we should move it to b5 to keep it in the game, or maybe we just think, should we even, should we just allow this trade to happen? Maybe if we just move our knight somewhere, then our queen will defend. We can consider stuff like that. Um, we should consider the value of the pieces without trading. So different thoughts. Again, the same kind of ideas. Some people are suggesting more abstract. How do we think about this position? Some are suggesting, let's look at a move and go from there. And I think both can be helpful, but uh, I am going to give some suggestions and guidance, so don't worry. We'll be getting to that, but I just want you to start thinking about 
how you think about these positions. Let me give you another situation here. Uh, and actually, in this position, for those uh, looking for it, I believe bishop to b1 is the best move. Um, we don't really want to trade our bishop pair if we don't have to. And even though it looks a little silly all the way on the square, notice that our bishop has a long range. It's looking at a lot of potentially important squares. So it's still fairly active from here. Okay, a new situation. Now, looks quite similar. Um, we still have maybe like a French type structure, right? You see a lot of these same ideas. We haven't had an exchange of these pawns yet. But now imagine we're in a blitz game. Five minutes, no delay, no increment, nothing. Our opponent has about three minutes and 50 seconds left on the clock and plays this move. We have about four minutes left on the clock and it's our turn. So we don't have not, we don't have very little time. So what should we be thinking about in this position? How does it change that it's a faster game? Does that affect anything? Is it's, should we think differently? Okay, uh, people in chat, long-term strategy, uh, we have suggestions of, um, Teo has seen the idea um, developing bishop or castling. So considering how do we get these pieces into the game, maybe we get our king safe. Um, someone saying bishop sack for the fun of it. And it is fun, but it actually is also the best move here. So in this type of position, you really don't have a lot of time to think abstractly, right? When we're playing in a blitz game um, and we have some tactics, like we've noticed that we are not castled um, and our opponent is, and kind of all of our pieces are starting to point in this direction. Our pawn chain is lined up in this direction towards their castle, you'll notice. And whichever way your pawns are facing, like kind of the angle, sometimes you'll have a pawn chain going this way, sometimes this way, that's usually indicating the side of the board you are wanting to be fighting on because your pawns will have more control in that direction. Um, so we want to fight on the queen side and actually here, if we look at our checks and captures, our forcing moves, right, any move, uh, we talked about this last week, but a forcing move is any move that forces our opponent um, to immediately respond to whatever our threat is or suffer some serious disadvantage. Sometimes they can't even uh, effectively avoid the disadvantage. So in this case, one of those would be bishop takes h7. Um, but notice that when we're in this type of position, we can't just sacrifice for the fun of it. We do wanna make sure, even though we don't have a lot of time, we would still wanna calculate and say, does this work? What would we do uh, depending on how they play? So bishop takes h7 uh, is, I think, a really good candidate move here. It looks like a reasonable position to try and get away with it. If they take with their king, what is our follow-up uh, move? If they don't take with the king, the good news is we can, at the very least, just drop the bishop back and we'll be very safe and we have won a pawn and their king is weaker. So they probably are obligated to take our bishop. What might we do in that position? Knight g5, very good. Uh, knight g5 check. And we're again putting black in a really bad spot. If they move their king back, what would we follow up with there? Mm -hmm. Queen h5. And with our knight, our queen together will be threatening checkmate. And this is kind of a Greek gift sacrifice. The problem here for black is it actually doesn't matter if they move their king away or if they take our knight, because either way, we have a checkmate threatened. If they take, we activate our rook and we still threaten checkmate. They can't like ever push the pawns to try and get out of it because we can always push this pawn now and cover their escape um, if they move forward, so we're, we're not going to go too much into the, the Greek gift theory right now, but if they move forward, there's a lot of good things you can do. Queen to g4 looks very strong, um, maybe threatening to play knight takes e6. You can also probably get away with h5 here and sacrifice this knight. If they take, I'm sure there is some checkmate somewhere. Yeah, this is mate. Um, and you can spend time now in a blitz game, you won't be able to calculate that. So you'll kind of have to go with your gut. Um, but it, we do think about it differently when it's our move versus when it's our opponent's move and based on the time controls. So those are just two of the ways that can impact how we actually are managing our time and thinking. 
Uh, okay, really quickly, uh, question, why castle? So castling is good sometimes. In this position, we actually want our rook to be uh, on the edge and part of the attack. Usually I recommend castling before your 10th move of the game. Um, in some closed positions like this one, you notice how these pawns are very locked up. You can delay castling slightly. Um, also notice how there's really none of black's pieces attacking our king at all. So we are still really safe even though we haven't castled. But usually you're gonna wanna castle. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, let's jump into kind of breaking it down based on the turns. Because I think this is really the biggest difference. So when it's your turn and your opponent's turn, I do think there is uh, a helpful distinction in how we actually start to think about these positions. In this position, let's say that we are looking at the board and our opponent plays the move knight to f3. There's a few steps I wanna give you for what your process should be, um, or at least what's been helpful for me, take it or leave it, uh, when approaching how do I make the right move here. The first question is, uh, well, the first step is if you're playing in a game like over the board or like for a tournament, you'll write down the move, take note of it. Um, if you're playing online, it does this automatically for you, but either way, you do wanna take a mental note. Okay, what did they just play? What's the actual move they played? From there, the real first step is find the threats. What have they threatened by their move? And there could be multiple ones. So really quickly, looking at this position, white just played the move knight to f3. Does anyone see if white is making any threats with this move? What threats might white be making here that we need to look out for? Maybe there are none, um, but maybe there are some. Well, in two moves, it can take the queen. Uh, how so? Oh, the knight. Oh, wait. Oh, no, no. I missed. No worries, no worries. Okay, so a lot of people in the chat have an idea, and they're actually correct. So knight f3 is making a really big threat. Knight f3 is actually threatening to trap our queen. Notice that our queen is actually just, it's, which is so crazy, because this is such a normal looking position. Um, but our queen is already pretty limited on which squares she can go to. She can't go forward or diagonal that way. The knight controls this square and this square. The bishop controls this square. This bishop controls this square. Um, so right now, the only, she actually can't move anywhere except for backwards. And we can actually use a piece with this knight to cut her off totally, and that is by playing bishop to g5. If bishop to g5 is played, this queen is actually just straight up trapped. So imagine we play some move like bishop e7 here, bishop to g5, and our queen has no safe squares. Remarkably. Okay, so our first question is we want to identify the threats. Uh, sometimes you will find a position where there are none. And in that case, you can move on to the next step. But in the case where there are threats, um, we want to now find what moves, what candidate moves can we come up with that would help us deal with the threat. If there weren't a threat we found, we would ask the same question, what candidate moves do we have? We just would be looking for any normal looking move, not necessarily how to get out of a problem. So a candidate move, um, yeah, so to summarize that, so when your opponent makes a move, the first thing you always wanna do is ask, are there any threats that they've made from this move? And sometimes it is pretty obvious. Like imagine instead of knight f3, they had played d5. Not a good move, gives up a pawn. It's not defended, but it does make a threat. It's threatening to take our knight, that's a problem. So we would need to find some way to deal with it. In this case, we could just take back. First question is, are there any threats? Um, and the next thing is we want to find candidate moves. A candidate move is just any move, it's basically like the moves you look at the position and you're like, this is kind of what I would like to play. Um, and I like to save that step until after we detect if there's threats against us, because it's gonna save us time, right? If we see this position and it looks like a normal position and you don't see this move, this threat of bishop to g5, then we're gonna be spending maybe a lot of time thinking, okay, maybe I'll play bishop to d6, or maybe bishop to e7 and castles. 
Maybe I'll play bishop to d7 to queenside castle. Like we're going to waste a lot of time looking at moves that are pretty irrelevant. Um, but once we detect the threat, we're actually ready to start analyzing our candidate moves. Okay, uh, yes. So what candidate moves would you consider here in this position for black? We don't want to lose our queen so early in the game. So what might we think about playing? Uh, okay, we could retreat the queen back to her home square. That's a good candidate move. What else? Yeah, a lot of people in the chat suggesting just pawn to h6, controlling this square. That makes sense to me as well. So, so far we have two candidate moves, queen to d8, pawn to h6. Any other candidate moves we should consider here? What would you play if you had black here? e5 suggested that's interesting queen to e7 interesting okay someone's suggesting a king move i'm not so sure about king e4 oh I, that was a, a typo it looks like uh, knight d4 okay so taking this pawn so we can come up with this list and what i would say is for every move we look at we want to say, first of all, did it stop the threats, right? So if we play, if we look at a move like knight takes d4, the problem is, does it stop the threats? And it's actually, this is a really interesting one. What do we think? Does knight takes d4 stop the threat of bishop to g5? Yes or no? Okay, so why not? What's the problem with this move? Uh, yeah, so we are kind of making a counter threat against this knight. And uh, they're actually, this is kind of a subtle subtlety of the position. If white is not careful, we actually can get out of the threat. So the question is, does this effectively deal with it or not? And we're going to have to see your reasoning why. Because it is a little trickier than it looks. So the chat is kind of jumping ahead, and you're correct in the chat. Um, in a way, this does prevent, or sorry, this does not prevent the threat of bishop g5. Um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't. Here's what I mean. This move absolutely makes bishop g5 a bad move. Because if you play bishop g5 now, what is black's response to not lose the queen? is a bit of a tricky one, but we always want to think about our forcing moves. So white's next move, they would love to take our queen, but actually because of the way we've put our knight, we can prevent that from happening by attacking something more important. So it's like E5? Uh, E5 right here. I, I think you might be onto something. Um, if we can threaten this king, then they can't take our queen, right? If you're in check, you got to get out of check. So do we have any moves we can play to threaten the king? Yeah. Um, knight to f3. Yes, correct. So this is actually called an intermezzo. We are going to play knight takes f3, and this is check. So there is now no time to take our queen. And whichever way white recaptures this knight, right? If they use their pawn or their queen, 
Either way, notice that now that knight is no longer there to defend this bishop, which means we can take the bishop. And our queen is safe, and actually we're up a piece. The problem with this move is not that it it does successfully prevent bishop to g5, but unfortunately, it actually loses to a different move. White now can instead play this really tricky line, knight takes d4, and you might think, wait, but I can just take back with my queen. What is white's move here to just almost win the game on the spot? Again, white has a really beautiful move that will end up winning the queen. Yes, and just like um, when we played knight takes f3 and called check, and you couldn't do anything, you had to stop the check, bishop to b5 is a check, but it also attacks our queen. So we have to do something about the check. We can move our king, we can block with the bishop or with the queen, but no matter what we do, white will always have a way to take the queen. Um, so knight takes d4 is a really interesting idea. It does prevent bishop g5. Unfortunately, it loses to something else, which means we're going to kind of jump back. And let me again do a quick recap of our steps when it's our turn. So they played knight f3. First step is, are there any threats, right? Sometimes it'll be by the piece itself, right? If we pawn to d5, then that piece is making a direct threat. In this case, it's the knight is now supporting another piece. That piece can make a threat on its next turn. And sometimes it's even something, is, it's like a discovery, right? In uh, the case of this variation, white makes a threat by a discovery, right? The piece that moves is not the piece that makes a threat. Now, at this point, it's too late for us to do anything about it. Um, but in principle, right, there's lots of ways a move can cause threats. So the first step, and it might be some time consuming, right, is you want to spend some a lot of time calculating what are the threats. Once you identified them, uh, we want to look at our candidate moves. Sometimes those will be preventative. Well, they're always going to be preventative of the threats, but they might do it in different ways. So like knight takes d4, the idea is we're not actually stopping the bishop from coming to the square. We are just going to take the knight if they do and win material that way. A move suggested earlier, like queen to d8, uh, is also not preventing the bishop from coming to the square, but it's giving us more wiggle room with the queen to escape or more potential blockers. So it's another way to solve the threat. Uh, the move suggested h6. It actually does prevent the bishop from coming to this square. But the, the key here is we're first going to, again, after we've figured out the threats, we're gonna identify all the candidate moves, right? All the moves we think, these are reasonable moves for us to play in this position. You know, in any kind of given middle game position, there's probably an average of 30 to 40 legal moves. If you spend your time looking at every single one of those moves, you'll, you'll be playing one game of chess for the rest of your life. So being able to kind of minimize down to what looks reasonable and first say if they have a threat, I don't have a lot of moves, like I can't just push silly pawns. I have to look at the moves that actually deal with this, either by making a bigger threat or by stopping your threat or by preparing answers for it. Um, so we'll look at all of our candidate moves, identify what we have, and then we'll kind of go through one at a time. My recommendation is to start with the move that you think just looks the best, right? Um, because if you start with other moves, if you start with one that looks the worst or one that looks the simplest or you know different things, you're probably gonna be wasting your time on variations you don't really need to be looking at. If you start with the, the what looks like the best, so let's say here we said, I think queen d8 is the best move for black. We can spend a good deal of time looking at this move, thinking what might they play? They still might go through with this attack. What are we gonna do then? They might just castle or do normal development. What are we gonna do then? And we can kind of think about that. And if we're happy with those positions, if we think they're gonna give us an advantage or at least not put us at a disadvantage, then we might well go for this. If not, then we'll continue and we'll kind of have this as a baseline, right? After we have looked at these variations and kind of understand where we stand, then we can start to look at some of the other options and say, okay, if I play h6, am I gonna be any better than I was when I played queen to d8? If so, then I'm probably gonna put that one up the kind of ranking 
And once I've looked at all of my moves, I'll say, okay, which one is at the top now? Which one do I like the most? My advice is also don't reanalyze any of these ideas, right? So if we spend some time looking at queen d8, you don't want to spend a lot of time then kind of coming back and saying, okay, what about h6? But wait, let me relook at queen d8 and let me go back and try and really look at it just one time. And if you need to refresh yourself on how you got to those positions, you can do that quickly. Um, but you really don't want to reanalyze unless like you are looking at a different variation and realize you overlooked something in the position and need to check everything again. That sometimes happens. Um, but otherwise, you'll just kind of be wasting time. Um, the last thing I want to say is after you have identified the threats, picked out your candidate moves, gone through some analysis for each of them, the last thing you want to do is when you've decided on a move, say we've looked at all these moves and we decide, okay, h6 looks like the best move here. Before you play that move, um, this depends on what format, whether it's online or something different, but the advice my coach gave me, which applied to different situations, was actually just sit on your hands. And the reason he said that is he said, once you pick a move, sit on your hands, and it will literally take you a second to do it, and it will take you a second to undo it, to then go either click or move the physical piece, and that will be enough time for you to look at the position with fresh eyes once more and say, is this a blunder? Am I like just giving up a piece or missing something obvious, right? So um, this usually is like the blunder retention or, uh, uh, or blunder avoidance check, but I've played a lot of games where I've looked and looked at a position and analyzed a few different moves. And then finally, I'm just like, okay, I'm not, none of these moves look good. I'm just gonna play a move like this. And I just like hang a pawn or I hang a piece or I give up a queen, right? So just spend, just it doesn't have to be long just a few seconds at the very end just being like okay here's the move i've decided on am i missing something stupid is this a blunder <laughs> so double check yourself you will really appreciate the five seconds you spend doing that okay let's move on we've spent a good deal of time with this idea of how to think and this is all remember this is when it's your turn to move so we want to identify the threats from our opponent's move look at candidate moves analyze them spend a little bit of time making sure uh, blunder prevention, and then play the move. But what about when it's your opponent's turn? Um, okay, so when it's your opponent's turn, it's a little different. So let's look at an opening line uh, in the Petrov defense. So uh, we'll, we'll take the side of white, e4, e5, knight to f3, and the Petrov or the Russian defense is when black plays knight to f6. Instead of defending this knight, or sorry, defending this pawn with a knight or with a pawn, um, black is counterattacking us. Okay, the main move here is to capture their pawn. And black is generally advised not to recapture right away. Um, it's a bit dubious because there are already some dangers of this file being so open for both kings, right? We can play a move like queen e2. And if, you know, black is not careful, if they just want to get their knight out of danger and do something like knight to f6, what can white do already to, again, almost win the game on the spot? What is white's best move in this position? Okay, what's your idea with queen c4? Uh, that gives me the opportunity, if they make a mistake, they don't catch that, you have the obvious attack. Yeah, yeah, you're threatening uh, checkmate, right? Yeah. So this is, it's kind of like a scholar's mate or like a form of checkmate, right? Uh, it actually, yeah, it'd be, I guess, six moves. Um, but yeah, so the same weakness. So this is really good. You're targeting this weakness. Actually, in this position, you don't even have to hope they make a mistake. They already messed up. Um, so that would be a decent uh, try to make an attack but we can actually capitalize even harder because if you'll notice, our queen and knight are lined up with their king. So they move their knight out of the way, which means if we move our knight, this is a, a tactic called a discovery where our queen will be the one attacking their king and they can't deal with whatever our knight's doing. So where can we put our knight to do the most damage? Knowing that they won't be able to deal with it at all.
We have kind of two competing thoughts in the chat. Some people want to go to C6 and some people want to go to G6. And those are the two best moves. Which one do we think is better? G6 or C6 and why? How come? Can they do anything to stop you from taking the queen? No. Correct. So both moves you win something. If you play knight to g6, we are going to win the rook because they're going to have to do something to block this check and we'll take the rook. But if we instead play knight to c6, we're actually going to win the queen. And even though they can move the queen to block, our knight on c6 still covers this square. So in the other example, um, they could block with like the bishop, for instance, and their queen is still safe. Um, so, okay, this is a bit of an aside, but I just want you to have some understanding of this defense so we know what's going on. So in this position, instead of taking our pawn and creating some potential weaknesses, uh, black is usually advised to first play the move d6 and kick our knight away. We move our knight. Now they can take, um, because now there's a little more safety, and there's a few different moves that we can play here, but the move I like to play is actually knight to c3. So if you don't have some opening knowledge, it's actually perfect for this example. If you are familiar with this opening, then that's okay. I think this will still be helpful for you. Imagine we get to this point, and our opponent has been kind of blitzing out their moves. They just know already what they're going to play. And they see you play knight c3, and they stop, and now they need to think. And they kind of immediately are like, wait a minute. If, you, if, I, if, you, if I take this knight, you're letting me just take this knight, you're going to have to double your pawns somewhere. And doubled pawns are usually bad, right? So they stop and think for a second, and then they're like, wait, well, this just must be bad. So they capture your knight, and you recapture. And now they stop to think, because this is a position your opponent just hasn't seen before. So they need to think, okay, what do I want to do? Which means... This is a position that we get to stop and think about. How should we maximize our calculation time while it's our opponent's turn? We have the benefit that our clock is not ticking down, right? Again, if you're playing in a tournament or if you're playing casually, you have the benefit that it's not the pressure of you're taking too long to play. Um, but either way, regardless, just because we have that benefit does not mean we should just be sitting around twiddling our thumbs until our opponent makes a move. We should be spending our time thinking but I do think we need to go about it differently. Because if we start looking at variations, right? Remember before in uh, this position, we were really thinking very concretely about, okay, they've made a threat, we need, or sorry, the threat is this one, we need to stop it. And we looked at some candidate moves, we identified those ideas and kind of debated, did some analysis and then made a decision. In this position, it's way different. Because now if we start to try and analyze candidate moves and like um, the continuing variations, well, where do we even start? Because they could play a whole bunch of moves and really any of them are potential. If you try and analyze all of these possibilities, it's like you're gonna be sitting there again forever and we don't have that luxury. And it's also not gonna be helpful, right? If you spend, let's say you spend 10 minutes and you go over, okay, if they play this, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. And then they play bishop e7, or vice versa. It's just not a good use of time. So my advice is on your turn, you wanna go through the steps I said. Candidate moves, calculation, identifying threats, blunder prevention. I mean, we'll do blunder prevention here too. Um, but we're gonna think about it differently. On your opponent's turn, my advice is to think really about the big picture. So look at the abstracts in the position. Um, unless the position you're playing in is incredibly sharp, which a sharp position is one where there's a lot of threats, a lot of things are hanging, there's maybe, each side probably only has one good move and you have to be really careful to find it. Um, that's more tactical. In those positions, you can think about the concrete lines because you have to know exactly the precise moves. In a position like this, like maybe some moves are plus 0.1 better, but that doesn't really mean anything. An opponent can reasonably play any of these moves and we're gonna have to be prepared for all of them. Um, so we should think big picture. 
Um, some of the questions I like to ask are, where do I want my king to be? Do I want it to stay in the center? Do I want it to castle king side? Do I want it to castle queen side? Let me ask you for this position. What do you think? Where do you want your king to be? I know it's black's turn to move, so they're going to be the one moving. But eventually, do we want this king to be over on the king side, over on the queen side, or somewhere in the middle? Or maybe we're undecided. What, what do you all feel? What would you, where would you want your king? Okay, you want king side. I see a few people saying king side in the chat. I mean, we definitely don't want it in the center uh, because we've just moved our, our center pawn out of the way. This one's gone, which means if we keep it here, it's just a sitting duck. So we do need to get it out of the way. Um, most people are saying king side. Uh, I think the argument for the king side is it's faster. We don't want our king to be in the center for long. And if you just do something like, you know, bishop, e, just move this bishop anywhere, really, and then castle, our king is safe. And I think that's very true. When I look at this position, I actually agree with Teo in the chat. I want to castle queen side. I think they're both possible, but I'm anticipating my opponent actually wants to king side castle because they have three pieces in the way of queen side castling. Their king is also fairly exposed in the center. So they're thinking the same thing we are, right? They want to get their king safe. But now look at this. How on earth is black going to attack our king for the next two or three moves? I think we have enough time to safely queenside castle. Even though it's not quite as fast, I still think we can do it. So if we are able to, then we get two benefits. One, we get the benefit of this extra pawn that acts as a shield that's going to try and intercept if they start pushing pawns against us. We have an extra pawn we just put here that's going to block our path. Secondly, uh, if we queenside castle and our opponent kingside castles, well now we have our own series of pawns that we're free to launch for an attack very quickly. Um, and it's harder for them to do that, as we said, because we've got this blocker. So I want to castle queenside here. But okay, that's one question. Where should we put our king? Uh, another question is related here. Where should I push my pawns? Sometimes in the center, sometimes on the queen side. In this case, my argument is let's castle queen side, push them on the king side. You can ask questions like, what do I think is the best square for my undeveloped pieces? You know, where does this bishop want to go? Where does this queen want to go? And if you can start to answer those questions, then you can start to think, okay, well, maybe I want my queen to go to e2 and call check and attack this file. But I don't want to do that before this bishop moves. So maybe I need to move this bishop somewhere first. Where do I want to put it? And you can kind of go down the line um, and start asking questions like this. And it's going to help you think whenever your opponent makes a move, whatever move that happens to be, you are now in a much better position to do the process we said before. Are there any threats? What are our candidate moves? Well, now we have a whole bunch because we know exactly what we want out of this position. Same thing, like if they play a move like bishop g4, we can ask these questions. What are the threats? Okay, there's a pin, so I don't really want uh, to deal with that. Um, I can start looking at if there's other threats, can they attack this pinned piece? It'll probably take a little too long, but maybe in a few moves. So maybe I break out of the pin, maybe I attack the bishop, and we can go through this line again. Um, but. But I want to still emphasize on when it's uh, our opponent's turn. So ask yourselves big picture questions about the position. Where do you want your king? Which side are we fighting on? Where should the pieces be ideally placed? Um, do you notice that this is a tactical position or is it relatively kind of just dry and positional? Is the position open or closed, right? If stuff is very locked up, then you're going to play differently versus if it's really not. Um, maybe you're behind in the position and you're looking to play for a draw, trying to find stalemate tricks. Um, you'll play differently in different phases of the game, right? If it's the opening, maybe I don't want to get my queen out too early. But if it's the end game, maybe I need to get my king into the game and be a fighting piece. So again, I'm, I'm giving this all to you as kind of abstract thoughts. But my advice is to really think when it's your opponent's turn, spend less time, unless you're in a very sharp position, spend less time on concrete variations and more time trying to understand the position 
make long-term plans because then when it comes to your turn, you're gonna be in a much better position to actually evaluate your candidate moves. Okay, I've done enough lecturing, let's look at some more positions. In this position, it is white to move and white plays to move bishop takes c4. So it is now our turn. What should we think about here? Given all the steps I just gave. First step, we want to identify, well, first we want to note what their move is. Okay, they played bishop c4. Our pawn is not there, their bishop is there. Are there any threats in this position? What do we think? What threats have they made either with that specific move or that are now maybe more dangerous because of that move. E6. Which one, I'm sorry? Okay, so threatening on e6. So um, it, do you think this is a credible threat? Like, is this something they're probably gonna do? No. Yeah, why not? Yeah, so this is pretty defended, um, and they usually you don't want to trade a bishop for a pawn, right? A bishop will say is worth about three points, a pawn is worth about one. So usually they wouldn't want to take here. Um, so the, the place the bishop's at doesn't look like it's actually making any immediate threats, which is good for us. And there's no, like, discoveries. It wasn't blocking anything. I mean, their king is ready to castle now. So they have some positional ideas, but I don't see any immediate threats. Okay. A lot of people are now taking a look now at uh, what are some candidate moves. And let me ask you two, uh, do you have any candidate moves, stuff that jumps out to you in this position you might want to look at playing? Yeah, we have a lot of people in the chat suggesting one move. The bishop to a4? Uh, or to b4 here? Uh, or this one to uh, a4? Yeah. Uh, sorry, which one? A a4 or... Okay, so a bishop to a4, what's your idea? Uh, to target the queen. Yeah, so we are hitting the queen, and the queen needs to do something about it. There is a bit of a downside, right? Um, the problem is, do we have anything that's defending our a4 square? Like, that's going to help support our bishop attack the queen. So, unfortunately, if we play bishop a4 immediately, then the queen will just be able to take it. So, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, no, the, no worries. It's not a bad idea, um, but we do want to, we'll, we'll have to set that up. So, we might need, um, that could be a more long-term thing to be aware of. Like, I'm imagining if we are able to castle, like, get this bishop out of the way, castle, and maybe put our bishop, or sorry, our queen on e8 to work with the bishop. That could be one method. You could try and like trade these pawns and then activate your rook to defend. So that could be a nice long-term plan, but not for me, it's not an immediate candidate move. Other ideas in this position. Yeah, so bishop to b4 here. And the idea is, well, actually, it's doing two things. One, this just is a free pawn, it looks like, right? There's nothing defending it. And we're going to pin this uh, pawn to the king, so they won't be able to push in the center. I mean, they can get out of that pretty quickly by castling, but we're still picking up a pawn and putting them in a threatening position. So, okay, before we commit to a move, right, we want to identify some, like, generally most of our candidate moves. But if you can quickly take a look and say, okay, maybe I play knight c6, Maybe I just bring the bishop out here. You're going to be hard pressed to find, okay, is there a, like, a, why would I not just take a free pawn? Um, now, this is kind of a tricky position because you do want to, uh, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on this one in, in particular, um, but white does have some interesting counterattacks. If we play bishop before, we do, before we play this move, want to consider what they could do in response to us. So again, more concrete thinking. Um, and in this case, they actually have uh, a really tricky move, queen to b3, which would attack our bishop. And if we move our bishop, it would attack our pawn here on b7. Um, now, this is not an unstoppable problem. We can actually get out of this. Uh, but we have to be a little careful about it. But um, 
yeah, again, I don't want to get too far down on this one, but the idea is if we want to make it so that queen taking, because we, we don't have a move that's going to defend both. Um, if we just move the bishop away, then they're going to take here and our rook is going to be in danger. And at the very least, they've won this pawn back. Maybe we're doing better because our development is better. Um, if we try and defend our bishop, then they can play something like pawn to a3. And again, the same thing happens. Our bishop is forced to leave and they will take this pawn. We actually have a very nice trick that it looks like Husa in the chat has found and maybe a few other people um, where if we play knight c6 and they, uh, they can't take the bishop, they can attack it. And after we retreat, they now can't take this because if they do, what is the punishing move we can play against them? What is the problem with queen takes pawn in this variation? Black to move. Yeah, a few people in the chat have some good ideas. So one person suggested, uh, or maybe a few people suggested knight a5. Knight a5 looks very strong, forking the queen and the bishop. The problem is white can actually defend both. If they play queen to a6, their queen is safe and they defend their bishop. However, we have an even better move, rook to b8. Our knight actually really cleanly defends our rook and pawn. So all of this stuff is safe. The queen still has to get out of the way. And now rook takes b2 and we win this bishop. So that's a, a little aside, not the main point of this lecture. Um, but regardless, the kind of thing you would want to be thinking about in this position, right? If it's our turn to move and we see, okay, we have a really obvious candidate move, bishop takes b4. We can consider a few others, but seeing as this looks so appealing, this would be a circumstance where I'd say, okay, it's okay to let's analyze this a little deeper because if we can't find a good reason not to do it, like you don't want to give your opponent the benefit of the doubt um, that they have something there that you don't see. Because if you play like that, then you're giving them the advantage without even having them have to work for it. So you do want to spend some time and calculate, but you don't want to, they could be bluffing, you know, you want to call their bluffs. Okay. Let's jump to another position once again. In this position, it is uh, black to move and black plays the move queen to e6. It is now our turn again. So let's go through our process. First question, they play the move queen e6. What are the threats? Do they have any threats in the position with that move or just in general? What do you see? What should we be concerned about here? And while you're thinking, so yeah, TWM, um, yeah, so the basic idea, we're gonna look at the bishop before move um, and just calculate it. This is the kind of thing, you'll go a little bit down the variation tree. I imagine it like a literal tree, right? You have the main ideas as the trunk, right? I think I'm gonna play bishop b4, and then I think they're gonna play queen b3, and then I think I'm gonna play knight c6, and whatever you think. And then you can do little branches as variations. Um, that's the part where, you know, the better a player you are, the more you can calculate, the farther you can go. But even if you're, you know, just starting out, you can still spend, you know, a minute or two looking, okay, if they play this, I think I'm going to do this. Or if they play this, I think I'm going to do this. And just start to be a little bit prepared for it. Okay, so does anyone see any threats in this position? Anything you're worried about from black here? Queen to B3 kind of worry me. Uh, make, me, make me pay attention to it. 
Sure, so maybe we'd have to be a little careful with queen to b3. They are pretty close to our king. The downside, and actually think, remember, they came from e, or sorry, from c4. So they could have played this here and decided not to. So maybe they're a little nervous about getting their queen too far in enemy territory. It doesn't have a lot of backup right now, but I can see why that might be a bit of a concern. To me, the main concern I have is I don't want them to push this pawn forward and try and break into my position. So I, I kind of want to stop that, but that's the only real threat I'm worried about. So after we say there's not really any major threats except maybe them pushing this pawn, um, the next thing we want to do is identify our candidate moves. So <laughs> spend a minute in bullet and get flagged. Well, bullet is a whole different beast. Calculation is a little harder there. Um, Okay, so what are some of our candidate moves? What moves look reasonable to you all here for white? And let's just name a few of them. Okay, rook c1 suggested. What else? Knight d5 suggested. Uh, bishop takes f6. I think you could make an argument for bishop h6 as a candidate move. h4 suggested. So a lot of different moves so far. Um, and what we would do is then in this position, we would spend some time analyzing what do we think is the best of those. So um, let's imagine, so I play the Pierk and King's Indian defense a lot. So I'm used to this position and I see this bishop h6 idea as a very common theme, trying to trade off these bishops. So let's imagine I think that looks like probably the best move. I'm going to play this move, or not play it, but I will imagine it in my head and think, okay, well, obviously they shouldn't take because then my queen gets into their territory. And the reason I would usually want to do this is because then I'm going to remove their bishop and their king will be a little weaker. This might be an okay long-term strategy, um, but... In the short term, I don't think I'm going to be able to attack too much. So I'll keep that on the back burner. And then I'll look at another move. And actually, so a lot of people in the chat have found really unusually in this position, we actually want to give up our bishop, not for this bishop. No, normally, we want to weaken these pawns um, and kind of clarify what that means if I just play some silly looking move here. Notice how in this position, these pawns all cover the white squares. And the bishop is no longer there to cover all of these dark squares. So this is a weakness that we can potentially try and exploit in the long term. So that's why I'm considering this idea of bishop h6. But actually, bishop takes f6 makes a lot of sense here. Because whether they take back with the queen or the bishop, let's say they take with the queen, then we can activate our knight on this really monstrous square, d5 where it attacks everything. It is like an octopus or a kraken. It's horrifying. And this bishop just can't compare. This bishop cannot ever interact with it because it's on a dark square. Um, I don't know that it's necessary first, but I like it first just to clarify the position. So maybe you could consider some other candidate moves that um, are doing something different. The fact that this knight is pinned means probably we can delay this slightly but I don't really see any good reason to wait. This looks pretty solid. So, okay. So again, what we did is we first saw they played their move. We spent some time saying, are there any threats? Maybe there's a few little ones, but I don't see anything big. Let's look for our candidate moves then. What moves do we want to play on the position? Um, and we'll analyze them until we find something that seems to be good or as good as we can find. We'll sit on our hands, make sure, okay, does Bishop F6 blunder anything silly? Doesn't look like it, we'll go for it. Um, okay, let's look, we have a little bit more time left, about five minutes, so I wanna look at one more position here. In this position, uh, it is black to move, and we are up a lot of material, but black plays this move, queen takes e3. Let's go through our process. First question, are there any threats in this position? So do you all see any threats that black is making with this move? 
queen takes e3 that we need to be aware of. So yeah, the queen can threaten to now invade our king. If it goes to g1, our rook actually here is able to defend. Um, so it is getting close to our king. So g1 is not the immediate threat, but it is good to be aware that that's a potential check. Any other threats made by this move? Yeah, so some people in the chat are suggesting if they go queen to g3, then they can now go queen to g2 with the bishop, and that would be checkmate. So we have to be a little careful of that, um, although that is going to be at least two moves, so maybe we would have a move to get something in for the defense. There's actually an even bigger threat. So see if you can find, if it was black's turn to move right now, black is winning the game. Even though they're down, I think, two knights, right, we have even rooks, even queens, bishop for bishop, but we still have two knights. But if it's black's turn, black is winning this game, so we need to really be careful about identifying the threats. The hint I will give you is this bishop is doing more than it seems. Yeah, a few people are seeing in the chat the right idea. So if it's black's turn to move, the problem is this bishop is actually pinning our pawn on g2 to the king, meaning this pawn cannot move, because if it moves, we would be in check, which means what can black do? Move queen over a3. Exactly. This pawn is pinned, so this is not really defended. So queen takes h3, our king would have to move, we can't block to g1. And then queen takes g2, checkmate, and that's faster, right? If they play here and then here, we get a move to try and stop it. But this, we have no time. So now that we have identified the threat, let's run some candidate moves. What might you consider playing here as white to stop this threat? Okay, a lot of ideas coming in the chat right now. King h2 suggested. Rook f3 suggested. Yep, perfect. Queen g4 suggested, knight f3 suggested. So I'll tell you, the good news about this position is that I'm pretty sure all of those moves are fine. Um, because we are up two pieces, two knights, as long as we can stop the major threat to our king, then we're going to be okay. Uh, and actually, I'm going to check with the computer real quick. Yeah, like every move is fine. King h2 is fine, knight f3 is fine. Um, basically, as long as we can either defend this pawn, right, so if we play king f2, we defend, or if we block the queen's ability to attack it, or if we put a piece in the way of this pin, then we're good. Rook f3, actually, this bishop does take, but we're still probably up so much material that we can get away with it. Um, but the way we find this is, again, you stop and sit and say, okay, what are the threats? And if we look long enough and can spot things carefully enough, we can actually start to see, oh, wait a minute, this is a problem, this is a problem. And then you can come up with your list of candidate moves. What do you think is going to be good? You can go through them uh, and find, if you find any of them that give you an advantage, feel free to stop there and play it after you do some blunder prevention by sitting on your hands. Um, but you can also spend a little time, depending on how much time you have, looking at other ideas and seeing if there's anything that's even better. Um, there's a famous chess axiom that if you see a good move, look for a better one. And I think that is true in a lot of situations, except when you're you know, down on time or something like that. So something good to consider for you as well. Okay, hopefully this has been informative. Um, to give you the recap, when you are thinking about moves to make, you want to do two things. When it's your turn, you want to be very concrete and think, okay, first, what are the threats? Second, what are my candidate moves? If there are threats, what moves can I play to stop them or nullify them? And if there are no threats, then how can I make my own threats or develop or whatever goals I'm trying to achieve in the position? 
Once you've identified your candidate moves, you'll analyze them each and try and find which one gives you the biggest advantage, comparing them to each other. When you've made your final selection, set in your hands, give it a final check over, make sure you're not missing anything silly, and then play the move. If it's your opponent's turn, you want to think more abstractly, big picture. What are my long-term goals in this position? Where do I want my king to be? Where do I want my pieces to be? Am I attacking on the king side or the queen side? Is this, should I trade for a winning end game? You have time to think about these big questions because your opponent's the one who's gonna to have to look at all the different variations. So that's my advice to you. I hope it's been helpful and uh, please stick around. Our next class will be given by Grandmaster Igor Novikov uh, right after this, probably just in a few minutes. So please stick around for that. Thank you as always for joining and I look forward to seeing you again soon.